This morning, I am reading from Mark 6, 30 to 38. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now very late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy something for themselves to eat. But he answered them, You gave them something to eat. They said to him, we are, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said, Jam, five and two fish. The word of God for the people of God. All thanks be to God. A young pastor was going to his first church in a rural setting and uh, showed up on the first Sunday morning to look out, and there was only one farmer sitting in the pew. But he said, I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm going to do it. So he proceeded to give his full service. Scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, epistles, the Psalter. He did the prayer, the sang all the verses of all the hymns, a full sermon, then the full communion liturgy at the end, and a benediction. And as the farmer was leaving, the young pastor wanted to get a little feedback on my first sermon, my first service. How was it? And the farmer said, well, it was a little long. And the, the farmer, I mean, the pastor said, well, if you were going out with your truck to feed the cows at the, at the water hole and there was only one cow there, wouldn't you give that cow something to eat? And the farmer said, yes, but I wouldn't give him the whole load. <laughs> so I want to assure you that with all the great music and the sermon and the communion liturgy, I don't intend to give you the whole load today. Um, that's when you give wild applause. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But in the spirit of Pastor Darrell, I promise to err on the side of mercy. Today, our scripture is best known as the feeding of the 5,000. It's in all four of the Gospels. Each Gospel writer has their own features to it that we can learn from, but they all have to do with bread and the feeding of the crowd. And in John's version, he even follows it with talk about the bread of heaven, and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So let's begin with prayer. God, take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. Make us masters of ourselves, that we might be the servants of others. Amen. The portion of the story that Alan read this morning uh, sets the scene, a desert wilderness kind of setting. 5,000 people, uh, the preacher heals and teaches and uh, preaches, and the preacher goes a little bit long that day, and uh, it's getting towards supper time, and the disciples want to have Jesus, you know, just say the benediction and send them home because there's no refreshments after all of this. And Jesus, just send them away. But he answers, you give them something to eat. And in one account, a child steps forward to share his lunch of bread and fish. And Jesus says, there's no reason to send them away. Jesus gives them this strategy to feed large crowd and groupings that turns these 5,000 strangers from all these different places 
into communities of sharing, uh, some 5,000. And there are many wonderful lessons that we can learn from this text. But I'm just going to give two, not three, I'm just going to give you two. First, you are only one, but you are one. You can't do everything, but you can do something. However small you think your gift is, bring it to Jesus and he will bless it abundantly because following Jesus is about partnership in meeting human needs. Jesus acts with the disciples. You give them something to eat. We lost Reverend James Lawson this past month one of the civil rights movement's most prominent leaders with Martin Luther King Jr. and mentor of nonviolent activism. His memorial was yesterday. In one of his speeches, Lawson said that God made an incomprehensible decision. God created us in God's image and expects us to participate in fulfilling God's vision for creation. Following Jesus means partnering in his mission. Discipleship is not a spectator sport. At the Juneteenth celebration at UCLA this uh, last month, the choir sang the battle hymn, uh, as we did this morning. And um, the sense of that song uh, on the celebration of Juneteenth uh, had a powerful impact to me. I never saw it quite that way before, as powerfully before. Um, as you know, in that story, the Emancipation Proclamation was delayed like a year before it got to Texas and the slaves were freed. And there was that sense as they sang that, that the emancipation is still delayed. The work of freedom and justice for all is not done. Civil rights is still an issue, and our political climate seems as fraught with problems as ever. White Christian nationalism has reared its ugly head. Hunger is still an issue and still vulnerable to budget cuts. We need to be allies and partners in the cause of Christ's kingdom. Truth is marching, and we are called to march in the light of God. And wasn't that performance this morning amazing? Shall we thank them one more time? And the trumpets, we got to thank the trumpets. Yes, thank you, thank you. Our scripture is about hungry people being fed and the beloved community being built. When Jesus says, you give them something to eat, he's speaking to us. Things could easily have gone very sour. You know, 5,000 hungry people. That could get pretty uh, testy. They can turn on you. Miracles aren't magic. He took a risk. There's no guarantee, but they followed his lead and all were filled. This church is engaged in hunger ministry with a strategy to feed the crowds. And Nikki Holsinger is leading of that share ministry. I invited her to come and just say a a moment about what that's about. Yes, I've asked Ash to give a brief message. But going along with Alan's message, one way our church responds to Christ's call to love one's neighbor and to share food is our share ministry. Uh, share ministry serves a meal every Saturday at 3 o'clock. And the name share is in part that six local churches work together, each taking a Saturday and ours happens to be the third Saturday of each month. The location changes. Right now we're serving at our church in Weeks Hall for the next six months. After that, we'll be back at the university church. Each church has a group of dedicated volunteers that plan, prepare, and serve the meal. Share Ministry also has been known as Feed the Hungry because the meal is open to anyone who would like it. And we really feel that this Ministry offers even more than food. We have a comfortable, welcoming, safe space, often out of the cold right now, out of the heat. So our church has been involved for this ministry since 2009, and that's 15 years. And we thank the congregation for all your support. Thank you. 
and we thank Nikki for her leadership. So the first thing is to follow Jesus is to join in a partnership of God's kingdom and to build the beloved community. A second word, I think, is that the passage also says something about how we sustain that kind of mission. She said we've been in this 15 years. How do we sustain that over a long period of time? St. Augustine said, without us, God will not. And without God, we cannot. There's a gift of bread for hungry stomachs in the story. There is also another miracle that underlies that. Pastor Darrell's always telling us to pay attention to the context of the passage that we're looking at. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the feeding of the 5,000 immediately follows what story? It's the story of the beheading of John the Baptist at the Herod's birthday party was turned into a death banquet, John's head on a platter. And that execution sent shockwaves across the area from Herod saying, mess with me and this is what you get. And Jesus got the message. But it cut even deeper for Jesus because it was personal. John was a guy whose camel hair clothes and living on wild honey and locusts embodied his message of truth to power. And Herod got the message. And John was also Jesus' cousin, a kindred spirit, a fellow preacher in the area who was at Jesus' ordination at the Jordan River. Jesus was grieving this grisly, senseless death of somebody that he dearly loved. In this horrible news of John's death, it hangs over like a dark cloud over this passage. Context is important. Jesus needed time alone with his disciples to regroup, to grieve, to process all of this. Let's Let's take a break. Let's go underground for a while. Let's come away with me to a deserted place beyond Herod's borders where it's safe and quiet and restful and a chance to clear his head and heal his heart. But the word leaked out. The hungry crowds followed. Jesus' heart is broken. He's exhausted. The powerful are threatening. And here comes the crowd. Does he make a run for it? In a study of our passage, Joanna Herider shares this insight. When Jesus' plans for getting away and being alone are ruined by this needy crowd, there is a miracle that we often overlook. Jesus has compassion for them. Compassion. In the midst of his own exhaustions, he recognizes the weariness of those in the crowd. In his own need for renewal, he recognizes their need for healing. In his own longing for time away with God, he recognizes their longing to connect more deeply with their creator. Jesus responds to the crowd, not with exasperation when he sees them coming up, but with compassion. And that's a miracle. It takes a certain spiritual groundedness to recognize when you need to get away to a deserted place alone for a while takes an even deeper spiritual groundedness to respond with compassion toward those who mess up your plans for solitude. David Brooks says that when bad things happen, a death, an illness, a job loss, or a disaster, it can take you to the depths of who you are. And you can either be broken, angry, brittle, withdrawn, or he says you can be broken open to reveal your own vulnerability, your soft inner humanity, your core. There's the normal biological response of fight, flight, freeze, and fear and anger, or there is a response that comes from that core piece of ourselves that doesn't have any shape, size, color, or weight, that inner core that gives us infinite value and dignity, one that causes us to hunger for beauty, to be called by beauty, to partake in beauty, to pay attention to acts of compassion, to sacrifice for a neighbor, to keep a neighbor safe. Brooks confesses that at one point in his career, he was so caught up in his work and the pressures of it and being ruled by those pressures that he had 
nothing for those who care, he cared about. He says, in relationships, you've just got to stop and you've got to stop uh, at unexpected moments when people need you. If you got a clock in your head, if you're always on the move, then people sense that distance and that you won't really show up for them. Jesus showed up for them with compassion. It was bad news. Disaster and grief had struck at the core of all of Jesus' hopes and dreams. Instead of being broken down, Jesus was broken open. His grief and sadness, fight or flight, fear and anger gave way to an inner depth of caring and compassion that is deep within us all. Jesus broke himself open into the life of the community as a fellow vulnerable, needy human being, and people saw it. They could see it. They could hear it. They could feel it. They resonated to it, and something broke up open in their own human core of humanity, and they began to share with one another. You know what it is to be broken. You know what it is to be broken open. When that miracle happens, people see it in you. It is in the core of who you are. It is in the core of who we are as a church. And today we remember another bread story. This is my body broken for you. It's it's risky. There's no guarantees. It's human. It's also divine. And it can open you up. And it is a miracle of grace in abundance. It is more than enough. It is not magic, but it is our only real hope in this world. Our faith, our hope is that there is an image of God that is placed within each of us, a divine spark. And if we can break it open and share it, no guarantees, not magic. Our hope is in Christ of compassion, broken open in us and for us, the bread of life. Amen.